The year is 1917. The Russian Revolution has come to Ukraine. Communists, nationalists, and whites are all fighting for this rich and thickly populated country. Soon, the anarchist Nestor Makhno will join the fray. But right now, he isn't in Ukraine. He's in Moscow. That's where he's been imprisoned for the last seven years. He wasn't a model prisoner either, always looking for opportunities to escape. The solitary confinement that won him soon caused him to contract tuberculosis. Whenever he wasn't being punished, Magno spent his time associating with other anarchists and frequented the prison library. But he was actually lucky to be there. Magno was originally sentenced to death, but due to him only being 21, it was commuted to 20 years of hard labor. But he wouldn't even have to serve that, because after the overthrow of the Tsar, a general amnesty was issued. Makhno was a free man. But he didn't just take that freedom and run. Instead, he returned to his homeland in Ukraine, where he'd fight to win freedom for others. To Nestor Makhno, that meant ending the state. It was here, in Ukraine, where the most successful modern anarchist society was formed, and where the Black Army fought to defend it. So you can call me Ezekiel. This is Nestor Makhno and the Ukrainian Black Army. Let's jump in! As soon as Makhno arrived back in his hometown of Huliaipoli, he began organizing anarchist councils and redistributing land from the Kulaks. Interestingly, he didn't totally dispossess the Kulaks, but let them keep a share of the land like anyone else. But Makhno couldn't just stick to political reform. The Russian Civil War was about to begin. In December, the Cossacks of the Don and a Ukrainian nationalist government began fighting with the Bolsheviks. Makhno raised an army of a few hundred men and fought alongside the Bolsheviks at Alexandrovich. There, they intercepted a force of Cossacks marching to join the Don Rebellion. Rather than fighting, the Cossacks agreed to give up their weapons to Makhno in return for letting them and their horses go free. These weapons allowed Makhno to grow the Black Army to 5,000 men. Unfortunately, the Bolsheviks didn't like Makhno's way of doing things. They arrested the Cossacks he had freed, and later intercepted a shipment of industrial supplies headed for the anarchist area. This shipment was in return for food the peasants had already sent to the cities. If the exchange worked, it would have been a successful example of anarchist economics. Luckily, the Bolsheviks were later pressured to release the confiscated goods, but their actions here were a warning of things to come. But before any more economic developments could occur, the Germans entered Ukraine. The Bolsheviks had been forced to hand the country over to them after an absurdly botched round of negotiations. The professional German and Austro-Hungarian armies easily defeated Makhno's forces, while Makhno himself fled into Russia proper. He spent that summer meeting various influential figures, including Kropotkin and Lenin. With his ideological faith restored, he returned to Ukraine to raise a new guerrilla army. As World War I turned against the Germanic nations, their Ukrainian occupation forces abandoned the country, allowing the anarchists to retake Huliaipoli. Makhno learned his lesson from the events at the beginning of 1918, and knew that a more serious black army would be needed to defend Ukrainian anarchy. For this reason, he proposed a federal structure to the army. Makhno envisioned a highly mobile cavalry force supported by Tachanki, which were machine guns mounted on fast-moving horse-drawn buggies. By the end of 1918, this new and improved black army had between 6 and 10,000 men, although it never became the fully mounted force Makhno had wanted. There was still the question of allies. Makhno was approached by both the Bolsheviks and Ukrainian nationalists. Now, while he was suspicious of the Bolsheviks, Makhno ideologically despised nationalism, so chose to work with the Bolsheviks to destroy it. During the key battle of Ekaterinoslav, the Black Army employed its signature tactic of sneaking soldiers into the city disguised as local workers, smuggling weapons in under their greatcoats. But there are also more dubious reports saying that some would smuggle themselves in while hiding in coffins or even disguised in wedding dresses. With his territory secure, the anarchist communes began to form once again. Huliaipoli was particularly successful, with one Bolshevik agent reporting that it had three secondary schools, medical posts, a workshop for repairing military equipment, and adult education for political agitation. And remember, they did all of that while they were still at war. But then, a new threat arrived. Denikin's white army started to probe into Ukraine. It wasn't long before fighting broke out. The black army was more than a match for the nationalists, but the white army were a much bigger threat. Up until now, the Reds and Blacks had only worked together on a circumstantial basis, but with the White Army moving into Ukraine, they decided to officially work together. Their new arrangement put the Blacks under Red Army command. In return, the Reds would give them all of the weapons, supplies, and equipment of a regular Red Army unit, and allow the Black Army to maintain its federal structure. 
With leftist unity achieved, the Red and Black armies marched to end the counter-revolution. Together, they made some headway into the Donbass, taking the major city of Mariupol, but their success wouldn't last. They started infighting again. This time, it was because the Bolsheviks were trying to forcibly take food out of Ukraine. When Makhno stopped their grain requisitioning detachments, tensions flared. They tried to talk it out, but external factors made these talks moot. Grigorev, the leader of a brigade-sized unit, rose up against the Bolsheviks. Makhno tried to stay neutral, but this only incensed the Bolsheviks. All of this infighting meant that when the Whites invaded Ukraine, no one could stop them. With the Whites rampaging through the country, Makhno resigned his command, and began taking independent military and political action. The Bolsheviks saw this as a betrayal, but with the White Army marching on Moscow, they couldn't really do anything about it. Meanwhile, Makhno wasn't doing any better. He lost Huliaipoli, and was forced to begin a long march to western Ukraine. Makhno met Grigorev along the way. They decided to hold a meeting with 20,000 of their troops to determine what they should do. Grigorev declared that the Bolsheviks were the true enemy of the working class, and so must be defeated by any means necessary, even if it meant working with the Whites. Now, Makhno had been suspicious of Grigorev for a while, and this speech gave Makhno a golden opportunity to get rid of him. You see, everyone in Ukraine hated the Whites, and Grigorev just made a public speech in their favor. Makhno gave his own speech, declaring that the only legitimate struggle against the Bolsheviks was revolutionary struggle, so an alliance with counter-revolutionaries was criminal. When the speech was over, a firefight broke out. By the time it was over, Grigorev was dead, and his men joined Makhno. But despite this windfall, the Black Army was still on the run. Eventually, they were trapped in an area near the city of Uman. South of them was the White Army, and to the north was Petliura's Ukrainian nationalist government. The Blacks and nationalists still hated each other, but they were both so hard-pressed that an uneasy truce was brokered between them. The Black Army's fortunes would soon change when they met the White forces at Paraganovka. Between 6 and 8,000 retreating Blacks turned to meet their 12 to 16,000 White pursuers. Fighting took place between the 21st and 25th of September. Between that fighting and the weeks of pursuit, both sides were exhausted. This led the Whites to make a mistake. They extended their supply lines just a little too far, and left their right flank exposed. Makhno noticed this, and personally led the attack against the weak white position. This surprise counterattack threw the whites into retreat. The Black Army pursued them. 5,000 of the whites tried scattering into the countryside, but they all got killed by local peasants. Makhno had just crushed one of the primary white units occupying Ukraine. This left the country practically undefended. To take full advantage, Makhno split his force into three columns, and rushed to the Dnieper River in just a couple of days. This lightning advance was made possible by requisitioning fresh horses en route, and with the help of massive peasant uprisings. Many of these peasants joined the Black Army, whose ranks now swelled to tens of thousands of men. Their advance didn't stop at the river. They crossed to liberate Huliaipoli, and then went further, reaching as far as Berdyansk and Mariupol. Berdyansk was particularly important, because it housed a key white armory containing massive amounts of supplies. During the battle, the armory exploded, but the Blacks still managed to salvage tons of weapons, equipment, ammunition, combat vehicles, and even a working airplane. This was an unbelievable blow to the White Army's already stretched logistics. The advance on Moscow had to stop, and even began to pull back. It's impossible to say whether the Black Army's actions here saved the Bolsheviks from defeat, or only ended the Moscow offensive early, but it was a significant victory either way. The Bolsheviks re-established contact with Makhno's forces as they chased the White Army into Ukraine. Very quickly, fighting broke out between them. It turned out that the Bolsheviks were still mad about Makhno going independent. This began a brutal eight-month guerrilla war, but no matter how much force the Bolsheviks used, Makhno could always count on new recruits and supplies from the Ukrainian villages. They all hated the Bolsheviks almost as much as they hated the Whites. Interestingly, Makhno's forces occupied an area between the Red Army and White-controlled Crimea, preventing further pursuit. According to Denikin, this is the only reason why the Whites were able to retreat into the Crimea and survive the Moscow offensive. For the Communists, this was unfortunate. Peter Wrangel, possibly the greatest general of the entire White movement, had replaced Denikin as commander-in-chief. He reformed the 30,000 surviving White Army soldiers into a crack force capable of resuming the war, and with it, invaded northern Torida. The Reds and Blacks may have hated each other, but they still hated the Whites more. It was time for one last leftist alliance in Russia. The two armies worked together to push Wrangel out of northern Torida, 
but failed to stop him from retreating into the well-fortified Crimean Peninsula. It was looking like they'd have to commit to a head-on attack across the well-fortified Parakov Isthmus. Or at least it looked that way until a strange weather event hit the region. Cold winds blew over the Crimea, lowering the water level around the peninsula. This created a new land connection from Ukraine that led to an area behind the fortifications on Parakop. Bolshevik units crossed and tried to surround the White Army to no success. So right before the land bridge disappeared, the Black Army, along with more Bolshevik troops, made the crossing. Together, they finally took Parakop. As a result, the Whites evacuated Crimea, and the Russian Civil War was officially won for the Communists. But there was still the question of which group of Communists would rule Ukraine. As it turned out, the Bolsheviks had already taken measures to make sure it was them. Almost immediately after defeating Wrangel, the Bolsheviks set about disarming the Black Army, and tried to murder Makhno. They managed to destroy some of the anarchist units, but Makhno and a lot of soldiers escaped back into Ukraine proper. The guerrilla war was back on. But by this point, the Bolsheviks had defeated all of their external enemies. All that was left were rebellions like Makhno's. The Reds slowly ground the Blacks down. And anywhere the Red Army couldn't succeed, political reform did. The hated grain requisitioning detachments were ended, and limited economic freedom was allowed in the Soviet Union. Due to these reforms, the peasants no longer had reasons to support rebels like Makhno. The Black Army responded by abandoning their heavy equipment, and dividing their army into small, highly mobile cavalry units. But that only delayed the inevitable. Soon, after losing several engagements, Makhno and around 100 of his followers fled to the Romanian border, and crossed into the country on the 28th of August, 1921. Makhno would spend the rest of his life exiled in Romania, Poland, Germany, and finally, France. There, Makhno lived in poverty and neglect before dying at 45. But such an inglorious end doesn't take away from his or the Black Army's remarkable achievements. In southern Ukraine, Nestor Makhno created a real anarchist society, one that seemed to function in spite of the brutal wartime conditions it found itself under. But even more than that, this society rose to the challenge of war, successfully creating a black army that was able to hold its own against proven statist militaries. This short and blurry glimpse into a real anarchist society begs the question, what would have happened to it had the black army succeeded and secured their independence? But unfortunately for us, the Bolsheviks destroyed it before we could ever find out. And that's Nestor Makhno and the Ukrainian Black Army. Don't forget to like this video, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell. And if you'd like to help us make more videos like this one, support us through Patreon, Subscribestar, becoming a channel member, and PayPal, links to all of which can be found below. Now, Russia wasn't the only major European power going through a communist revolution. There was another. So up next, we're going to take a detailed look at that revolution. More specifically, we're going to look at the men who stopped it. I'll see you then. Чему ж так вышло?